Hello, students. Okay, we're going to continue along with fundamental NMR. You recall before the break, I was just introducing you to um, the orbital hybridizations in a magnetic field, external magnetic field. So let me bring up the PowerPoint slides, and we'll get underway. Diamagnetic anisotropy. Let me go full screen. And uh, ring current effects. Pi bonds, aromatic systems, chemical shift. The unusual chemical shifts associated with hydrogens bound to carbons that form pi bonds. We want to account for wh why they're downfield from TMS. Okay, for example, an aromatic is uh, ballpark 7.3. You can always tell if you have an aromatic compound by looking at the proton NMR spectrum. If you get absorption between 6.8 7.5, you probably have an aromatic system. Here we see an alkene, example number two. We have the secondary vinyl and the primary vinyl. The secondary 5.3 ppm and the primary at 4.7 delta units. And then the aldehydic, which is off scale at 9.0. Carboxylic acid H, aldehyde H, off scale, between 9 and 12 delta units. M million dollar question, why is that? Well, the pi electrons are freer to move than the other, uh, the sigma electrons, in response to an external magnetic field. So when you look at an aromatic ring, it's planar, it's sp2 hybridized. You have a pi cloud above and below the plane of the ring. The hydrogens, because of the geometry, are all orthogonal, exposed to the external magnetic field. So the induced magnetic field is in the same direction as the applied magnetic field in the region where the protons are located. What does that mean? Downfield, dramatic downfield shift. Because they're in the wrong spot in terms of geometry with the circulating pi electrons above and below. The protons show signals at higher frequencies because they sense a larger effective magnetic field. And the alkene and aldehyde, same thing. SP2 hybridized, and you can see where the H's are because of the geometry of SP2 hybridization. Alkene, aldehyde. The alkyne, however, shows the signal at a lower frequency than it would if the pi electrons did not induce because of linearity. You have two pi bonds, a cylinder of electron density, and the four atoms, hydrogen, carbon, carbon, and R, are linear, 180 degrees. And as a result, they're in a conical zone of shielding. So they're surprisingly further upfield than aromatic or vinyl hydrogens. Okay, we showed you, I believe, this uh, neopental bromide is the common name. And what you have are a group of uh, three methyls, nine H's, and two methylenes. That's a four and a half to one ratio, and you see the integration, seven to 1.6. And the area under each signal is proportional to the number of protons giving rise to the signal. Very important aspect of proton NMR is that we can tell the area under the curve and how many belong to that community. Integration line. One one dichloroethane ratio of protons one to three. And then 1, 2 dichloro, 2 methylpropane, uh, 2 to 6, or uh, I always like to say the larger number, 3 to 1. And that's what you get. Now we get to the very important splitting of signals. A proton NMR signal is split into N plus 1 peaks. Remember that before the break? Alpha and beta, heads or tails. It's quantized. Where N is the number of equivalent protons bound to adjacent carbons. Adjacent carbons, coupling and splitting. Coupled protons split each other's signal. The number of peaks in a signal is called the multiplicity. It could be a singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet, septet, complex multiplet. 
Now, this is an important slide, of course. A proton NMR signal is split into n plus 1 peaks, where n is the number of equivalent protons bound to adjacent carbons. Coupled protons split each other's signal. And the number of peaks in a signal is called the multiplicity. The splitting of signals caused by spin-spin coupling occurs when different kinds of protons are close to one another. They can sense if they're alpha or beta. They can sense that with the neighbors. For example, this is... Uh, Methyl propanoate, simple ester. Community A exhibits a triplet. Community B, a quartet. And C is isolated with near oxygen. That's a singlet. It's not the number of protons giving rise to a signal that determines the multiplicity of the signal. It's the number of neighbors next door plus one. Pythagorean theorem. Equivalent protons do not split each other's signal. Bromomethane, one signal. 1,2-dichloroethane symmetry, one signal. Okay, here is an account of what's going on with the N plus 1 rule. Suppose we take this compound, and we're showing you the methyls in, in yellow. There's one neighbor, right? One neighboring hydrogen. The chemical shift of the signal for the methyl protons, if there were no protons on the adjacent carbon, you'd get a singlet. But if the magnetic field of the methine proton, the neighboring age, is in the same direction as the applied magnetic field, the adjacent methyls will show a signal at a slightly higher frequency. They will also detect the ones that are lined up against the field. So when they absorb energy and they relax, they resonate, they give some of the energy to solvent molecules, but they pass some of it, they see whether the neighboring H is with or against the field. Isn't that a marvelous thing that can be detected? And it's alpha or beta. If it had been more than one or two, uh, it would be a mess. Now the methine, that's going to have the three neighbors, and 3 and 1 is going to give you a quartet. It's a 1, 3, 3, 1 ratio because of heads and tails and probability. This is the key to understanding that. The three neighbors can be all with or all against the field or combinations, and it turns out to be 1, 3, 3, 1 quartet. So you can have singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet, quintet, sextet, and septet, or complex multiplet. Splitting is observed if the protons are separated by no more than three bonds. That's normally what we're looking for, three bond coupling and splitting. Three sigma bonds, one, two, three. You could get long range, one, four, and that shows up a lot when you have a pi bond, in the example on the right because that can transmit spin information long distance. Sort of like superconducting uh, electric power lines. Long distance. So pi bonds will cause more complex NMR or spectra than you would think otherwise. Because you can and will see four bond coupling Normally, without that pi bond, you normally wouldn't see it too often. Can you ever get a gem coupling and splitting where the two H's are on one? Oh, yes. Yep, yep, yep. We'll see it. Long-range coupling definitely occurs over pi systems such as benzene. Here's more examples of hydrogen NMR. Here's 1,3-dibromo propane. You have community B comprised of four H's and community A comprised of two. So you are going to get quintet and triplet. See the integration two to one? 
and the ones next to bromine, community B, are going to be further downfield because of the bromine. A is further upfield. And of course, you zoom in so you can clearly see the pentate, the, the pentat and uh, the uh, triplet. Now notice the spacing between the arms of the multiplet. For example, the triplet and the pentat. Those spacings are equivalent. You can you actually get little blocks. <coughs> Excuse me. And those blocks, each block is worth a certain number of hertz for a 60, 100, 220 megahertz machine. The spacing between the arms of the multiplet is called J, the coupling constant. It's a physical constant and it has a value in hertz. That's going to be very important to the J value. But first, the simple case, the triplet, two neighboring protons, the quintet, or pentet, four neighboring protons. Here's another example, but uh, no big deal. Community B, it's an isopropyl ester. Community B has six. E is a single methine H. And then A, C, and D on the other side of the carbonyl. The D is alpha to the carbonyl, and then you have C and A. So you're going to get one, two, three, four, five signals. One, two, three, four, five signals. CD integration, three, six, two, two, and way downfield one. And the one that's way downfield, close to five, that's going to be this critter, E, right next to oxygen, because that's where ethers show up or carbons with hydrogens next to oxygen. And that would be three, three is six and one, septet. And then they're showing community B with one neighbor, one and one is two, there's your doublet. So they're identifying the isopropyl group, septet doublet is what you get for an isopropyl, whether it's in this compound or in a drug. The doublet there, that has one neighboring proton, and the septet, six. Then you get triplets, two neighboring protons. Sextet, five neighboring protons. Now, here comes trouble. When you start to get allelic systems, you're going to get long-range J4 coupling and splitting. And what we have there is allele bromide, a bromine attached to an allelic carbon. You have community A, the allelics, B, C, and D, each community having one H, and they are not magnetically equivalent. D sees B, C sees the CH2Br, and of course you don't have any rotation around the double bond. You have Z and E type scenario. Now even though you don't have Z and E geometric isomers, there is no free bond rotation. One of those H's is seeing CH2Br. The other is seeing an H. So that's why D, B, and C are magnetically non-equivalent, and that means you're going to get coupling splitting all over the place, including long range. And now look at the integration, 2, 1, 1, 1, and look at that hefty complex multiplet showing up at just about 6.0 delta units downfield. That's because it's coupling and splitting all over the place. What a mess, huh? The three vinylic protons are at relatively high frequency because of diamag diamagnetic anisotropy. They're down here. And the allelic is further upfield around 3.9, 3.8, integrating for two. Then you have one, one, and the complex critter. That complex critter is somebody that's coupling and splitting all over the place. Now, ethyl benzene. You're getting integration for five complex multiplet consisting of ortho, meta, and para hydrogens. And then you're going to get the quartet and the triplet for the ethyl group further upfield. The signals for the HC, HD, and HE protons overlap because the electronic effect of an ethyl substituent is very much like a hydrogen. So you're not going to differentiate and get wide spacing. We simply call it a complex multiplet, 
of aromatic hydrogens integrating for five. Here's nitrobenzene. That makes a difference. You can differentiate ortho metas and the para. And you see the ratio 2, 1, 2? Well, there's your para with one right there. And then you have the orthos and the metas. Now, if you go to a large enough magnetic field, 800 megahertz, you can resolve that beautifully first order, spread them all out, and you'll be able to tell which one's which very easily because they spread out and they don't, they're not on top of each other. With a smaller magnet, these would be jammed in together and you wouldn't even be able to tell. Here, at least with this magnet, whatever size they're using, we can differentiate the chemical shifts. The signals for HA, HB, and HC, the point is they do not overlap because of the strong electron withdrawing property of the nitro group. We will stop right here for lecture part one, and I'll have an assignment for you. I'll be telling you more about that by email. And uh, we won't be, of course, we're not meeting. I, I'm taping this during spring break. I don't know yet what Pitt administration is going to decide for the balance of the semester with this uh, coronavirus. But we're definitely not having class if we do come back to campus next week, the week after spring break. We're not having class because I want to wait and see if that virus expresses itself. It may take two to nine days, we I'm told. I don't have a degree in public health, but that's what I read. So I don't want us in the classroom and one of us, maybe me or any of us, have this and we're coughing and you're in the room subjected. So uh, that's why we're going to go online, whether we're here or you're not on campus. And I will have an assignment for you online. I'll tell you when it will be visible in CourseWeb. And uh, you'll have a set amount of time to record your answers and send them to me by email. And I'll give you instructions. But uh, we'll have an assignment. And I will be back with uh, lecture tape number two on NMR as we move along to the next topic. See you down the road. Bye for now.